Hi, welcome back to the Introvert's Edge. So what we're going to look at now are some of the characteristics of introverts. Now you may find that you relate to some of these characteristics and you may find that some of them you don't relate to at all and that's okay because it's not a hard and fast rule with any of these things. But what may be of some help is firstly to understand that there are other people who view the world in the same way that you do, you do. but it also may be a surprise to find that there are other people who don't view the world in the same way that you do. So by going through these characteristics, this will just give you a bit of an understanding both of yourself and others that you are working with. And then once you can understand how you are observed in the world, then you can make choices about whether or not that suits you in the workplace or whether or not you need to change or temper anything and start using it to your advantage. So one of the most typical characteristics of people with introversion is this natural tendency to observe or to stand apart from people and things rather than interact with people. And how well you do this is going to depend on other factors like your life experience, formal learning, and your whole type orientation. So where you are on the scale, how social you are. And because you have a preference for observation and analysis, this lends itself to actually standing apart, stepping back, even detaching a little. And in many circumstances, this is appropriate and really useful and an effective strategy because you can actually train yourself to become a keen observer and to use this characteristic to your advantage by noticing tendencies in others, picking up information that others may overlook, and also picking up on subtleties of a conversation or a situation. However, if you're working in a team or working with people, stakeholders, clients, you may need to be a little bit more aware of how your natural tendencies are impacting others because then you're free to choose if you want to expand your repertoire of behavior or continue as you are. So as an introvert you might often find that you need time to think before changing your perspective. So for example if someone asks you a question or shares an idea with you it's a natural process for you to, to spend some time clarifying, reflecting and analyzing. And you'll usually do that internally, whereas an extrovert might do that externally. And so sometimes if an extrovert is asking you that question or, or, or sharing that idea with you, there might be a moment where they're sort of disappointed or they might have a reaction because they're waiting for a response, but it's not necessarily forthcoming straight away because at this stage you don't have a response. And it doesn't mean that you're slow or anything like that. It just means that you're doing the processing within your head. That's right. And we're talking about the time it takes before changing perspectives. So for people with introversion, it's going to take more time usually to change their ideas, to change perspectives because they are analysing, they are going through a certain well-orchestrated method of thinking and reflecting before they can actually change their ideas or change their mind about something. So for people with extroversion, they may be disappointed because they've stated their case really clearly and emphatically and you still haven't changed your mind. And this is where we can see there's conflict in conversation and timing can happen with introversion and extroversion. So give someone with extroversion that comfort and tell them that you are thinking about it. So this characteristic might sound similar to the previous one uh, where we talked about it you need time to think before changing perspectives. There's a slightly different twist on this one. So you tend to respond carefully and thoughtfully to people's people, ideas and concepts. And you prefer depth over breadth. And with that comes the ability to shape and mould ideas and thoughts. And you place a lot of importance and value on an idea. So if someone in the workplace is asking your opinion, usually time is of the essence and they want to get your opinion straight away. However, because you respond carefully and because you really reflect on ideas, you may not be so 
giving over of that idea unless you have that time to consciously and carefully think and respond. Yeah, so an analogy of that might be an artist. An artist doesn't want to reveal the finished product until it's finished. <clears throat> in, in some cases, not always the case, but because uh, introverts think of, think of their thoughts uh, as an art form, that's why we, we like to finish it off before it gets revealed. You usually take time to get to know. It's easier to manage and easier to have deep, thoughtful friendships with fewer people. Now, in a work situation, this can be a little bit of a disadvantage because we need to be able to establish rapport quickly. We need to have relationships with people because we're going to be asking them to do things. We need to influence outcomes. So if you know that this is a, a tendency of yours, that it does take time to get to know you, Perhaps you can start to expand your repertoire of behavior and share a little bit more about yourself sooner so you can actually start to establish rapport quicker. Yeah, and I'd make the point it's not necessarily because you're uh, consciously trying to make people not know you. It's just you, 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 as an introvert, you don't have that uh, natural tendency to share of yourself as early as an extrovert might. So someone with a preference for introversion is likely to have a preference to know a few people and to know them well. And this is actually an unconscious structure that's set up to help protect their energy. Because their energy is depleted in large groups, they set up this protection by just knowing smaller groups and fewer people, but knowing them well. The most common feedback that I have received as an executive coach from managers who have people with introversion in their team is I really want them to expand their network. I really want them to expand you know, their relationships and the people that they know inside and outside the organisation. Now, if this isn't a natural tendency for you, be aware that you may be blocking people from your circle or your network and stepping back instead of encouraging relationships. So just start to be more conscious and be clear about who you would like to be a part of your network so you can expand your base of knowledge and experience. And, and this isn't a case of rushing out and suddenly trying to become everyone's best friend. That's not what this is about. Just being aware of that resistance that you might have. Most of the time you're unconscious of it, so we're encouraging you here to be aware of it so that you can create more opportunities where you can get to know others well. You have a depth of interests and ideas and like to understand topics in depth. You guys are going to be the subject matter experts at work. So the point about this is back yourself. You do have the knowledge. You do have that understanding because you like information that is written down that you can absorb that information so use it in the workplace now you probably recognize this is when when someone asks you a question about something that you have some expertise in that's when you're likely to become more extroverted and more animated and so don't be um don't be uh, don't hold back on those situations when you do have a chance to express your expertise just go for it 100 percent So a natural extension of the, the previous characteristic where you usually take time to get to know is you also prefer to know a few people well. So introverts sort of unconsciously have this uh, sort of limitation on people that they allow themselves to get to know very well. And, and that's a form of protection for them. It's a way of protecting their energy. And one of the biggest feedback that I have received from people leaders and managers who are managing people with introversion is I want them to expand their network. Now, because this isn't a natural tendency, be aware of this. And instead of just blocking people from your inner circle, perhaps start to be more conscious of allowing 
people into your network so you can expand your pool of knowledge and your experience. Yeah, and it's not a case of rushing out and sort of suddenly trying to become everyone's best friend. That, that's not what this is about. Just being aware of that resistance that you might have. It, it's, most of the time you'll be unconscious of it, but just be aware of it so that you don't sort of... Um, so that you create more opportunities where people, where you can get to know other people well. You can be seen as a quiet and calming presence, especially in times of change and chaos. And this is a key advantage when people are running around with their frenetic energy and you are calm and centered and sometimes even reserved. And they can model that behavior and calm themselves yeah exactly and sometimes you may need to actually take some leadership in a, in a chaotic situation and step up and offer a different perspective to those who are running around with like chooks with their heads cut off that different pers perspective can help them be calm and sort of meet your energy halfway rather than them continuing as they are so that that, that again is an introvert's edge that you can bring to a team situation You feel comfortable being alone and like solitary activities. Like you actually prefer one-to-one -one interactions. You prefer projects that take time, that have research and analysis because you like being alone to do that processing and exploration in your thoughts, in your head. So at work, if you're in a open plan office, how can you develop um, some strategies that allow you to extract yourself from the frenzy of you know people and interruptions and work alone so is it booking a meeting room is it going outside is it being able to um, cut off interruptions and turning your voice onto voicemail because then you can get some really good solid work done and if there's some project work that you're involved in and, and it comes time to divvy up tasks identify which of those tasks you think you might like because it gives you some solitary or one-on-one -on -one time. Sometimes you can spend too much time reflecting and not moving into action quickly enough. Remember, extroverts act, introverts observe. So I want to share with you a story of a client who was quite introverted and their enthusiastic employee. So their employee was quite extroverted at work, often came up with new ideas. However, when she tried to discuss these with her manager, she felt that her ideas were dismissed or even ignored. So her manager was surprised to hear this because he'd listened really carefully to her ideas and was thinking of ways of implementing many of her suggestions. And sometimes he was thinking about other things and was processing other things when she would share her ideas and interrupt. So the manager is now learning to offer immediate feedback and the employee is respecting her manager's preference by asking first if this is an appropriate time to talk rather than just launching directly into her ideas. And this scenario plays out at work quite a lot. So notice whether or not you are giving feedback to others while you are processing what they're saying because then you're giving them a level of comfort that you're actually integrating and listening to what they're saying. In, in fact, if you're an introvert in an intimate relationship with an extrovert outside of work, you may well find that this is probably one of the biggest causes of conflict and frustration is you may be uh, receiving information from the extrovert and you think you're doing the right thing because you're processing and analyzing it and all that sort of stuff however because they're not getting the feedback uh, that becomes a source of frustration for them so this plays out just as much as home at home as it does at work because no cues mean bad cues for an extrovert you are comfortable with silence. This can cause other people to be a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you're relating to an extrovert who likes feedback, who likes exchange. So in one-on-one -on -one conversations, this is when it is going to play out a lot more than in large group environments. So perhaps take a pen and paper in and look down 
so it looks to the other person that you are contemplating. So it's kind of like matching another person's level of comfort as well as being authentic in your own processing of information. Yeah, in fact, you're probably more than just comfortable with silence. You actually appreciate it. So that, that pen and paper tip that Jan just shared with you, that's a way of you creating opportunities for silence to happen. You have a tendency of taking a back seat or staying in the background. You expect others are going to find out what they need to know anyway. And you suppose that others are not that interested in knowing what you know. And so you don't share it. And if you are going to take anything out of this course, it's share what you do know sooner because it is worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, so an extension of that is what you might think is obvious isn't necessarily obvious to other people. So just come out and say it anyway and make it obvious. You are comfortable with silence. This can cause other people to be a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you're relating to an extrovert who likes feedback, who likes exchange. So in one-on-one -on -one conversations, this is when it is going to play out a lot more than in large group environments. So perhaps take a pen and paper in and look down so it looks to the other person that you are contemplating. So it's kind of like matching another person's level of comfort as well as being authentic in your own processing of information. Yeah, in fact, you're probably more than just comfortable with silence. You actually appreciate it. So that, that pen and paper tip that Jan just shared with you, that's a way of you creating opportunities for silence to happen. You can sometimes forget to check with the outside world to see if your ideas have traction. You know, the physical world is where ideas and analysis are taken for a test run. Yeah, so, uh, so as introverts, we will spend a lot of time, uh, as, as we've talked before, getting an idea and perfecting it and polishing it. And once we get it perfect in our head, sometimes there's a, uh, a risk, if you like, of putting it out there and making it imperfect again, and so we tend to hold back. So, But if the idea is just remaining in your head, then it's probably not the best place for it to be. So take the risk, get the idea out there, test it in the real world, get some feedback, and you may even be able to perfect it even further. You are comfortable with silence. This can cause other people to be a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you're relating to an extrovert who likes feedback, who likes exchange. So in one-on-one -on -one conversations, this is when it is going to play out a lot more than in large group environments. So perhaps take a pen and paper in and look down so it looks to the other person that you are contemplating. So it's kind of like matching another person's level of comfort as well as being authentic in your own processing of information. Yeah, in fact, you're probably more than just comfortable with silence. You actually appreciate it. So that, that pen and paper tip that Jan just shared with you, that's a way of you creating opportunities for silence to happen. You prefer to have information, especially new information, ahead of time. You like to have well thought out answers and to be able to cover all options and you do that with written information. So if you want to be your best at work, try and solicit as much information and context as you can before a meeting or before you actually have to hand in a opinion or an idea. And if you are managing people with introversion, give them as much information and context as you can beforehand. Also a tip for people with introversion, 
ask yourself a couple of questions beforehand, questions that you think people may ask you. So then you've already actually started the process of analysis and reflection before you get in to the meeting or had the conversation. You have a tendency of defending against external demands, intrusions and interruptions. And the normal work environment is actually set up for interruptions and for people with that preference for extroversion. And if you do have this tendency of defending against these interruptions and demands, perhaps you need to start educating people around you about what you actually need to be at your best. Yeah, so that might take the form of a hat that you wear or a flag that you fly on your desk. Um, it could be closing the door of your office, whatever it is. Just have some signals, or it could be particular times of day, but have some signals that other people understand is your time just for you. That's it. And sometimes the outer world will give you necessary information and insight that you're actually looking for. So again, be prepared to flex your style and to look out instead of habitually looking in. So you prefer to share well thought out near perfect ideas or concepts or even questions. So in a work environment, people are expecting you to share what you know. So off the cuff conversations, presentations, you might walk out and go, oh, I could have said this or, oh, you know, I wish I would have been able to have shared this information. It, it's not that you're purposely holding back it's just that you haven't had the time to process and extrovert it so if you are asked your opinion or you need to give someone an answer to something perhaps you can prepare a little caveat like given the information I have at the time this is what I would suggest or given the limited amount of info this is what I would say, or this is what we need to do next. So it gives you a level of comfort that you're sharing what you know that hasn't been perfected, but also gives the other people a level of comfort that you are actually sharing information with them. So this goes back to the, um, to the fundamental question that we covered earlier, is this going to make me look bad? And that's one of the reasons why introverts don't share their imperfect thoughts is because there is a risk of looking bad. So by adding that caveat at the beginning, given what I know now, based on the information I've got, blah, 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 this is my answer. So that's, that's what the, the purpose of that caveat serves. As introverts, we tend to be less tolerant of small talk or of having people say things just for the sake of saying them or, or for wanting to hear their own voice. And so we tend to speak in shorter sentences. We're sort of not verbose. We don't go into grand detail. We just pick out the essential facts or essential matters and we get that across as quickly as possible. Now that can be a disadvantage in the corporate environment because especially when you're trying to get to when others are trying to get to know you, it may not establish rapport so much. So don't be afraid to add extra details that you might not normally add to a sentence or a discussion. You have a tendency to speak with a quiet voice and if you have been given the feedback before about turn up the volume, I can't hear you, what are they saying, notice this feedback and perhaps you might want to start practicing projecting your energy to the room, using your body, not just your voice, expanding your diaphragm and I've even had clients go down to large uh, basketball stadiums or um, open air courts and practice throwing their voice using that energy to the other end of the field because once you actually start to practice it then it's going to be a little bit more comfortable. Now we're talking about being authentic and we're talking about extending your way of behavior so it serves you because what you have to say is important and people need to hear it. Especially because you don't speak 
as often as someone else might. So even though you are efficient with your words, or because you are efficient with your words, you've got to uh, yeah get as much value out of them as you can. And if people are saying, speak up, I can't hear you, there could be that tendency to think of you as not being confident, whereas that's totally unrelated. This is just about projection. Yeah. You usually have subdued body language and not particularly expressive with your hands, your body, or even eye gestures. And body language is really an outward reflection of your emotional condition. And people are going to make up their minds about you by what you display to them in the outer world. Now, this is just initially because body language is the language of influence and rapport. This is the language of establishing relationships and bond. So notice your body language because people are going to form 60 to 80% of their initial opinion of you in less than four minutes and you want to be on the front foot because influencing outcomes, influencing ideas is going to be directly related to your ability to indirectly control and affect the actions of other people. So you want to gain acceptance and buy into opinions, ideas and propositions. So use as much of yourself as you can. In fact, this goes back to the previous point about speaking with a quiet voice. Effectively, what we're saying here is you may have a tendency to speak with a quiet body. So by adding some body language, you can add an enormous amount of impact to the words that you're using. Now, one of the things that extroverts often do, because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves, is we downplay our strengths externally to the outside world. And this is where we, we talked earlier on about how the world rewards the extroverts. That's because they tend to uh, be more overt and there's more opportunities to acknowledge their strengths. So, but as introverts, because we hold back sometimes, those opportunities don't come up. So an example might be, let, let's say you're, you're in a team environment and there's a project going on and there's an important task that comes up, which you're well suited for, but because you don't want to big note yourself or you don't want to uh, edge someone else out of that opportunity, you might hold back on putting yourself forward for it. So the trick is to notice when you are holding back in those situations and push through it. Stand up for yourself and say, well, actually, I think I could do that task very well. That then gives people an opportunity to understand some of your strengths, gives you an opportunity to express it, and then there are more opportunities for reward and acknowledgement that come about as a result. So we've looked at a lot of the uh, characteristics of introverts. So let's just spend a few moments here looking at when you are at your best. When is an introvert at their best? Now, the first and most obvious point there, because we've covered it a few times, is if you have opportunities to take quiet time. If you can build that into your day, then that gives you time to put your introversion to work as much as you can. And when you can spend time in the internal world of ideas, be able to reflect upon conversations that have happened, information that you've gained throughout the day, and also to contemplate what your moves are or how you're going to proceed. When you can take in information or ideas ahead of time, you're going to be at your best. When you can plan or review your day and your week, you are going to be at your best. When you can think things through and by writing a plan of action will help you to solidify those ideas. When you have the opportunity to analyse situations, events and experiences, then you are going to be at your best and be able to put your best foot forward. And when communication is brief, accurate and to the point, then you can process that information a lot more clearer efficiently and effectively. So as this module comes to a close, it'd be a good idea to just go through those qualities and ask yourself, how many of those qualities am I getting in my work at the moment? Is there enough quiet time? Am I taking time to plan or review my day or week? And if you're not doing some of these things, build them into your work routine so that you can be at your best.
So as well as having uh, displays of introversion, extroversion on an individual level, there are also introversion and extroversion on a cultural level. And you can see here there's a list of uh, countries and sort of where they are on the scale of introversion and extroversion. Well, you can um, guess that the USA would be quite extroverted. You know, they build stadiums so people can come together, interact. When they greet each other, they shake their hands. Small talk is considered um, a social norm. Whereas on the other end of the scale, like Finland, you know, conversation for its own sake is considered a waste of time. And even in places like Japan, there's a quite an introverted culture. You know, they have those, um, you know, the tea gardens and they have places of serenity and peace and quiet and spaciousness and also even karaoke bars where they can demonstrate their extroversion however they do it in small intimate group settings so that's just a little bit of an example how people can demonstrate different scales of introversion and extroversion. In lecture two we looked at the characteristics of introverts. They get their energy from the inner world of ideas and reflection. They prefer space and they prefer quiet time. They need time to process information and analyse thoughts and feelings. They share well thought out responses and ideas. What you need to be at your best is when communication is brief and to the point, when you have time to process information and written information usually well ahead of time. Lecture two also looked at psychological type and how it's universal. And Carl Jung saw it as the basic structure of the human mind, which can be expressed through our culture, but also through our beliefs and values. Culture reflects the values and behavioral norms of a society. And the basic question is, is what it actually takes for you and people like you to fit in. And you'll see this in the corporate environment. I have been in a corporate environment where on one level in the same organization is very different culture to what it is two floors down. And so sometimes it just takes up to three months usually before someone can start to feel like they fit in and are like the people around them. So when you're asking feedback about your culture and about the people in your team or environment, you usually want to get people who are new to the situation and the environment to get you some fresh perspective. So also what we looked at in the summary of lecture two is how type defines inborn preferences, while culture establishes the ways in which those preferences are expressed, because that is going to be different depending on whether or not you are extroverted in a Western culture or extroverted in, say, an Asian culture.